evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to the Bump Drops and Pray podcast. I am your host, Peter Rodvalza. And with me, I have my good friend, Mr. Earl Goddard. Hello, Earl. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm excited for this episode. Not like the other ones are not good, but this one is pretty The rest are rubbish, are they? <laughs> not, really, not, 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 not rubbish, but it's, it's our first real interview. Uh, on the English podcast, on the Portuguese podcast, um, we have a few interviews already and we'll continue doing so. But that said, and like the title of the today's podcast says, today is Emil Bernstorff Extravaganza. Hello, Emil. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's our pleasure. I like how I look into my screen and we kind of look like we're looking into each other. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we have Emil here because he's actually kind of a one of my favorite streamers, but it's not where you started. And I, I, I was going to have the names here and I was going to put under mine Pedro Ars Barbosa, like I have in your Discord. But that was a little bit too much. Uh, context, he called me an Ars <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> and to be honest, I am sometimes. <laughs> and I can vouch for that. So yeah, we're going to talk about your career. You're a form, former uh, racing driver uh, we got up to GP2 but we're going to go there uh, and I'd like to talk a little about your career of course and your life but as well about the parallels with uh, Earl's career or not parallels and do kind of a battle of uh, generations let's say <laughs> how it was back then and how it was Kind of also back then. And I'll just like to start saying that I'm really happy today, not just because you're here, Emil, but because finally I'm not the youngest. <laughs> 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 not far, but yeah, I'm not the youngest. So yeah, can you please tell us uh, like where are you from and kind of your background, let's say? Yeah. Um, well, so um, well, it's always a tricky thing when someone asks me where I'm from. Like, uh, I uh, so I, I've lived I lived in England and Denmark mostly, and then also a bit in Portugal um, when I was growing up. So um, yeah, I sort of don't really know where I'm from necessarily. Like, I don't strongly associate with any particular uh, country, but. Um, Yeah, so um but I've I've so I ran under like I think I ran under English, Danish and then also one point Portuguese uh driver license or flag. Um so I don't know. I, I sort of was, collecting flags. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Were you collecting flags? <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> I have I have them all lined up on my I had a a point on my stream where I had them all lined up. I had like sort of six or so. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sort of mainly English and, and Danish. Like my parents are Danish. So um, I speak both English and Danish. And um, yeah, I'm working a bit on Portuguese, but I'm very bad. I was going to say you talk a little bit of Portuguese because we, I actually tricked you a little bit into talking Portuguese in your stream. And I know oh, you're yeah. not that bad in Portuguese. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's tough. It's tough. I, I'm I, I'm worse at it than I really wish I was. <laughs> you have to come here. I already told you. If you come to Portugal, I'll cook you some dinner. You have my oh, yeah. my home is your home. So <laughs> and I'll teach you all the Portuguese swear words. Although I think you <laughs> I know, know some. Of them. <laughs> <laughs> I know most of them. <laughs> so yeah, and um, where did this uh, love of motorsport come come from um well so like i was initially like really interested in trains but um my brother was the one who was like who really liked cars and um yeah he sort of started getting really into like cars and then he sort of dragged me a little bit in and we started watching 
like uh i think we went to brands hatch um to watch a race i think it was uh it was formula ford and british gt as well back in like 2001 i think and um yeah then um just kind of got interested like kept seeing f1 ads on the tv and then uh drove past the cart track on the way to uh tesco one day um so we used to live in uh right next to brooklyn's um like the old um the well i think it's sort of technically maybe the world's first uh permanent racetrack um and uh yeah i used to live like right next to it but never really knew but then we drove past the car track and uh saw the helmets whizzing above the barriers and i thought that looked quite fun so i kind of never really looked back from there i guess so it was right away nagging your parents to go sit on a cart and then start from there yeah like we kept um <laughs> well there, there was a height limit i think it was like 140 and i was like 132 so like every i think every week i <laughs> i got my parents to measure me <laughs> um and they were like you're still you're still 132 and okay now you're 133 but like stop, <laughs> stop bugging us um and then yeah and then we found we actually found a place where the height limit was 130 so um yeah um but that was my mom took me not my dad my dad was away on a trip <laughs> initially <laughs> and then i yeah found this place and uh yeah that was that was the first time i went karting and that was really fun i found that quite entertaining <laughs> yeah uh and oh, how did you jump from just going on a rental cart and then starting competing at that's young age because when did you start like i think it was all three right i kind of yes yeah. somewhere oh three was my first race like so i started cutting when i was eight and then did my first race when i was 10 and um excuse me yeah we um well basically like i was i was just driving around at this uh, at brooklyn's cart track um and um it was it was actually sam bird just came like he as a young carter he he was i don't know what he was doing he was like making a tour of all the um cart tracks in the area or something but he came down in his like and had a two seater with cart with him and uh, drove me around which was quite fun to sort of be passenger behind him because he was pretty quick uh in a really quick go-kart as well can't remember what exactly it was but um it was faster than the the sort of cadets that I'd done before. And um yeah, and then just told my dad to get get me a go-kart. <laughs> <laughs> just like that? <laughs> and your father Yeah, did. he was like <laughs> Yeah, he was like, Oh this kid's pretty quick. You should you should buy him a cart. Oh. And um and then my dad was like, Oof, you know, he seems to know what he's talking about and if he says that Emil's good, then you know, maybe I should get him a cart. I mean I'd already been telling my dad to get me a cart for ages, but <laughs> Then he, then he did. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I mean, it must. I'm thinking as a dad as well. I mean, it must be. It must feel good to have say that your son actually has a talent for this weird uh, sport. It's let's face it. It's kind of weird. <laughs> we love it, but it's kind of weird going around circles in the motor cart <laughs> but yeah <laughs> i mean i mean people like to race things so you know i, I think it's uh i think it's quite like natural for people to like something like racing and i mean motorsports like the fastest form of racing we sort of uh do as a species isn't it more or less yeah i think we run <laughs> so i don't know i, I get that's kind of why i like it <laughs> Yeah, and bringing to Earl, I, I think I know the answer, but Sorry. W w why did you start picking up a cart? It was it, family. Very similar, <laughs> very similar. Yeah, obviously the family business was motorsport and my father was involved. But it was the same thing. Went karting at an indoor track. I can't remember where it was now. And someone else said 
should think about it because could have some talent. So, <clears throat> being his dad was in the industry, he put a call out to Martin Hines, Mr. Karting, and <clears throat> I ended up going down doing a test down there with the Zipcar boys, and they were like, and it was a pretty much a, do you think he's worth spending money on or not? And they were like, yes. Yeah, not the shittest we've ever seen. <laughs> and <then it's> like, <laughs> so, so, yeah, and then it progressed from that. So, go from indoors and, like you say, the right person telling your dad that, oh, he, he might have a something there. That's all it takes. And then, yeah, start doing a bit of racing. But it must have been kind of different just because your dad was in the industry because he, uh, unlike Emil Z, that he. I probably didn't know who Sam was at that point. It just looked like he was he knew stuff about it. Your father kind of knew everyone, so he, he knew who to value the opinion, right? So it must have been like yeah. easier in one yeah. sense and maybe harder in another because he probably will kind of look at you and know already if you were kind of good or not. Yeah, but then obviously, like you know, as a father, you you think your child's the best, no matter how good or bad they are. <laughs> but yeah, so he just so that's the way he went around it. Of go to someone and like say at at that time, so that would have been ninety three, ninety four, mm -hmm. and that was like my Zipcart was the team, the place, and. We were also doing work for Martin in his 250 supercarts as a team. We did um, built a development wing for him that he took to Hockenheim, I think it was, when he set a speed record in that cart. So there was a bit of it was into bit of into work. How fast did he get it? <laughs> I, don't, I think he was what, he was close to 200 or if not, I can't remember exactly, but I know they were, we basically, we created a, took an F3 wing and turned it into a cart wing. <laughs> so it was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was good. It worked. <laughs> he won the championship that year. So I, I, I just, I, I don't know. Those, those guys that do those carts are just crazy <laughs> oh they're, they're nuts completely nuts man <laughs> uh yeah so then career started uh cards um developing uh how did you find the whole karting experience let's say because it must be a little bit different from car experience but i mean i don't know i never been a racing driver so you tell me <laughs> yeah yeah like um well i mean at the start so it was just i mean how most kids start right you start with your your dad and you and uh you know a cart and then maybe like a trailer well a trailer to sort of ferry it around uh i mean the first the first race we went to we didn't even have a trailer so we um we actually put it in the back of the jeep it was like <laughs> When you're driving, it was like the bumper was sticking to the back of your head. <laughs> um, but yeah, then we got a trailer quite quickly after that when we realized that wasn't going to work. But um, yeah, like my my family never had any like interest in racing like at all. Like my um, my uncle wanted to be an F1 driver at one point, but not for very long. Uh, he got shut down quite quickly. Um, but yeah, like apart from that, it was just it was just me and my brother that were interested. So we didn't, you know, we, we didn't know much about anything with karting. So it was all like every week was a learning experience. It was like you sort of show up, and then someone's like, "Oh, maybe you should have wet tires," and then you're like, "Ah, oh, yeah, good idea." Or like, and it, it was just you know, we just showed up, put the cart on the track, and then I sort of drove it and. Uh, um yeah and then we we would learn something every week but um it was yeah very very much hodgepodge sort of uh 
you were the doing the, all the mechanical stuff yourselves, right? Or... Yeah, yeah. For the for the first two years uh, in sort of southeast England, um, and um, yeah, it was a uh, it was tricky. But like we won, we won the first. So in the first weekend, I managed to win a heat. Um, and then in the second race, I managed to win the final. It was like Honda Cadet rookie, but there was quite a lot of lot of people signed up. But it also helped <laughs> that we had brand new tires as well. <laughs> but like you know, that was also at that time you would just basically you would buy a set of tires and then run it the whole season. So we were also wondering. Like I started doing a lot of self reflection at the end of the season because I started going slower compared to everyone else. <laughs> but it was just because we had old tires, like season old tires on it. So. Um, yeah, the start was definitely like, but it was, it was, it was good fun. It was really nice. And, um, yeah, we, we got some, got some good results. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I, yeah, I got like second in, in one of the national championships and I got seventh in another one. So it was like, it was, it was good, but, uh, yeah, it was still kind of like a hobby at that point, really. Um, um, but then, yeah, after that, we started, we went to, uh, we moved to Portugal and then, and then we found a, a team basically based in Portugal, which, uh, was a bit more serious. Um, so then it started getting a bit more, a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more serious and, uh, and yeah, kind of went from there like, uh, but, uh, yeah, I never, I never really learned how to drive the faster carts. I was quite good in the slow ones, but I was never really that good in the f in the faster ones. Like, um, um, well, I've, I yeah, I, I finished second in like the Portuguese Championship or the Portuguese Cup, and I did. I can't remember where I finished in the championship, but um, yeah, it was sort of everything was kind of winding down a little bit. To be honest, like I had uh, I had a really really bad season in two thousand eight, uh, my second year of like European where I. I did the WSK series, if you know what that is. It's like European, um, yeah, it's like basically the European Karting Championship, more or less. Not the cup, but um, mm. sort of top level. But yeah, it's um, it's super duper competitive. Like you had people like uh, uh, there was it was like Robin Fryens and Jack Harvey was in there, and a bunch of other really 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 super super quick people. Um, Oliver Rowland as well. And uh, I didn't manage to make a single final all year, um, just because I didn't really understand how to drive those carts. Um, so I was driving it like I'd seen on TV, like Jensen Button or Michael Schumacher was sort of driving it like really smoothly, maybe. And but uh, yeah, it turns out you kind of have to flick them in, which I didn't learn until like <laughs> end of season, <laughs> four years ago or something. <laughs> 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 Honestly, yeah, yeah, but at, um, at that point in karting, I, at least that's what it seems from outside that you really need someone to really take care of your kart proper, like a very good team. There are stories about yeah. Kubica preparing Lewis and Nico's karts beforehand mm. and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I was I was with a with a team that was doing like um, it was doing okay. It was sort of like. I think they had one race where they were running near the front, but generally speaking, they were kind of like mid-pack or something. And then me at the back, obviously. But <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I never really got I never really got the hang of hang of like European karting, and um, yeah, kind of had a really bad season. And um, yeah, I kind of thought it was over then. At that point, like I was like, okay, well, I'm super slow. Uh, everyone else seems to be quicker than me, you know, like what's you know i don't i don't i don't enjoy driving around and like you know fighting for like fourth last or whatever so um yeah then i just had a year off in 2009 um and uh yeah then in at the end of 2009 i actually did a test for um in Lausitzring and my teammate that week um yeah this was in formula renault 2.0 and my teammate was Will Stevens. And um, yeah, everything sort of made a bit more sense in that thing. Like, uh, yeah, it sort of all clicked a bit. And uh, I managed to 
beat him in sector one. I think he was his like third season. It would, would be his third season in Formula Renault. And um, yeah, sort of. It was it's so sim straightforward because you have all the data. Like they can just tell you what you're doing wrong. Um, like you, you know, you can just see exactly where you're slow, where you're faster, and whatever. And they just tell you like, oh, okay, you're braking too much, or you're you just need to carry a bit more minimum. And then I was like, ah, okay, I'll just do that. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. Yeah, like um, yeah. I mean, um, in karting at the time, some teams were having um, had data, but our team didn't, like, because like it, all the costs were like exploding, and um, yeah, it was yeah, some people were paying like hundreds of thousands to do European karting basically at the time, and um, yeah. So anyway, so um, yeah, you just they just told me what to do, and I did it, and <laughs> it was so it straightforward. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and then 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 I was like, ah, okay, you know, maybe I can figure this out. So yeah, <laughs> kind of, uh, kind of, kind of clicked more with cars and carts then. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't know what I was doing in the cart, and like I think people were telling me, but it wasn't like they wouldn't, you know, it wasn't. You can see it. Like on on the data, you can just see it. And you're like, ah, that makes sense. In karting, it's all like theoretical and and um, well, it's it's not theoretical, but it's like you have to kind of imagine it. And Visualization like, more, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, I was a bit stubborn as well, to be fair. <laughs> oh no, racing drivers. <laughs> yeah. <does. laughs> no, yeah. no, 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 never. I never heard of one. <laughs> And how about you, Earl? Did you have much telemetry in your carts? Um, no, not really. <laughs> it was much the same as that. We went, got a little trailer in one of the mechanics. Well, actually, end up one of our guys who was driving F3 for us was, okay, he was South African national champion <laughs> karting. So he was like, right, I'll go with you and just for fun so he came and we went i think we did the winter series around here and and then it became apparent that same as that you need to be with someone or with the team and that's when dad got back on and spoke to martin and ended up going into the zip car awning mm. and had a had a mechanic from them and help if we needed it but it it wasn't a works drive, so to speak. You know, we were paying to be in there, but it just meant that I wasn't having to do my own changes in sprockets. I wasn't having to do that. I had someone who was there with me, and we did that for a couple of years, and pretty much the same. I never got into the faster stuff for well, for us in those days, it was hundred B and ICA Formula A stuff, and that's what um davidson button weldon all those boys were driving at the time and i was in tkm mm. and tkm at that time we had um gary paffett and conway and those boys coming into it so again quick boys and we were all right we weren't i think i won a f won a few club races national stuff British champs, I think I had a top 10 in one of them was probably the best, but they, they were some of the fastest boys around. Like most, most of them have got to F1 at some point out of that, like the guys that were winning. So I don't feel too bad. <laughs> but yeah, and that was the same thing. And it was about probably it was end of 95, 96 that I said to my dad, can he organize? going to Formula Ford at the because we but we our race team was based at Silverstone, so it's like right, let's speak to the driving school and see if we can get it going to Formula Ford and just to get get it out of my system. You know, car is better to stay in karting. Cars isn't you're not interested. In, like let's just try it and had it going a sixteen hundred Formula Ford and well that was game over. <laughs> The, the carts were parked and it was time to go proper racing. Yeah. 
Those things are fun as well, the forwards. Oh, I loved them. Loved it. it it's so rudimentary, is in four gears, taco, no rev limiters, nothing like that. It's all as simple as it can get. You didn't have a rev limiter? No. <laughs> oh, wow. No, that's how old it was. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So I take it from your <laughs> reaction that yours had. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we, um, so I did, well, I did Formula Ford, the British Formula Ford Championship in 2010. Uh, it was with the Durotech thing. I uh, can't remember. But yeah, oh, I did. Still, yeah. Yeah, no, I started in 1600 Kent engines. So like early 90s stuff, and then did British Champs in the, with the Z Tech. So that had a, lim- that had a limiter, but. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, uh, um, yeah, we still had age pattern and stuff, and uh, uh, yeah, like it took me. I think the only time I did a proper heel and toe was in the last race of the <laughs> season. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they were so, they, you, like, the team was really annoyed at me. They were like, "You, you just did. You, you tried to get you do to do this the whole season, and you do it the last race." <laughs> And then um, go away. <laughs> and then yeah, and then I never needed to use it again because everything else was sequential or or paddle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's yeah. fun. <laughs> so okay. yeah, then you spent one year at Formula Ford, but two different championships, right? Oh um, yeah, so it was basically we did it was we did one um, like one championship so the british formula Ford championship and then um because they were going to zandvoort we did a like a practice race for that um in uh yeah in the the benelux or i think it was um yeah formula Ford championship um yeah and uh yeah it was good it was good it was um i mean for, for me like the most fun i had racing at all was in formula ford just because it's so mental <laughs> like the the racing is so close the cars have no grip you're sliding the whole time um and it's like h pattern and it's it's like it wasn't it wasn't a carbon chassis it was the it was it you call space frame yeah space frame tubular yeah. chassis yeah um and like and the everyone's cars. got no fear. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Everyone's 16, 17, 18. <laughs> Nothing can hurt you. And um, yeah, it's mad. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen the the there's a there's a massive crash in uh, in Brands Hatch where the the car just goes like flipping over end over end in 2010. And that was actually that was my the car that I raced that season. But um, not you inside. Not with me, no, no. It was, it was. Well, I, I did. I tried my best to get it to do that all season, to be fair. But um, finally, yeah. So I, I didn't, I didn't flip it, but I, I had, I had one where I went like all the way on my nose almost, and uh, I flew straight over Dan Camish in uh, Castle Coombe as well. Um, but yeah, like finally in the Formula Ford Festival, as soon as I got out of it, it just went for an absolute massive cartwheel in in paddock hill bend so i don't know so i blame the car i think i think <laughs> Earl wins here because formula ford and um brand's hatch for you is not so happy memory memories right wasn't it your crash <laughs> yeah well one of mine <laughs> you race long enough you crash a few times yeah uh yeah coming down I think it's Druid's the left-hander down the hill. I lost it there on the exit and pinged across the track backwards into the barrier. And yeah, there weren't a lot left. Oh well, it, wait. Um, the it's one left, of the, yeah. is it, <laughs> the little Graham Hill is the little Graham angled, the little right yeah. left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just slightly ran wide and. It pinged round, went backwards into the barrier on the left-hand side. Okay. Basically, broke my seat, left an imprint of my back on the fuel tank, the alley cover of the fuel tank. Yeah. Wow. 
I would say it was a bit. I was a bit stiff for the next couple of week or so. <laughs> and that I think that was the festival, or it might have been the weekend before the festival. They have a race and then the festival. Mm. It was that. I remember it was that time of year. Not nice weather and yeah. Well, oh. really. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. I mean, <laughs> you could get a proper imprint on the <laughs> fuel tank. Yeah, it, uh, it was. Yeah. Uh, Looking uh, back on it now, you think how to get away with that because that should have been health and safety and set aside and. But, Did you walk away yeah. from it? Uh, oh yeah, we we're racing the next weekend, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Refit the seat and go again. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. 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 Fucking seat crazy, probably, yeah. Seat was pretty <laughs> unusable, I guess. After that. Um. No, I, I had I had one. Well, I cra- I think I crashed twice at Brands Hatch, but one was like where I went straight off into into Paddock Hill Bend, like just braked on the bump. There's like a bump, um, yeah. and you break if you break right on it, you obviously lock up instantly because your car's light. So I did that, um, and also it's a bit too late, really. I think as well. So I did that, and then yeah, just went straight into the tires there. And uh yeah, completely winded and stuff and and then I did another one as well, straight into the barrier in uh in uh in uh clearways. So I was I did purple purple uh at the Brands Hatch DTM weekend in twenty ten in qualifying and then uh and then crash it's straight into the uh straight into the wall like at the fully like what do you call it? Like ninety degree angle, like head on uh, into like one row of tires, and uh, yeah, I hit it. I hit it like dead on, um, so I didn't get pole sadly. <laughs> you think um, that? But yeah, the Alonso battery, the battery, did it also. <laughs> yeah. purple, purple crash. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, it was because the throttle, the throttle stuck basically, like going, going into the right hander. And it was a boop, like pushing me on, and uh, yeah, um, straight in. And the the battery came out of the casing and just went straight into like the back of my ankles. Oh, nice. Um, but it, no, it it just I was just wondering why it was sore there, and then the mechanics were like, oh yeah, the battery. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that was yeah, that was probably the hardest impact I had in my career. But yeah, those 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 things are fun, man. Um, <laughs> They're coming to i racing. Yeah, I'm super. I'm super excited for that. Yeah, They're really good. We we got three sales just here, so i racing. Bring <laughs> it on. <laughs> I exactly. haven't driven in sim because I haven't driven in real life. But in sim, I haven't driven Formula Ford since Netcar Pro. I don't know if you guys even know what that is. Yeah, I did try. I uh, yeah, it was like right around the time of like live for speed and stuff, right? Yeah, live for speed. Was... Now we're talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a uh, yeah. It Net was Carpo. kudos. Did, the the did, same did. guys from Assetto Corsa. So it was yes. the previous Netcar Pro. Mm. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Still have my license somewhere. I, I found it the other day. I think you oh, can yeah. actually download it some way. So let, let's let's talk about real racing, or maybe me and Emil will host a fun <laughs> race with that, because <laughs> it was actually fun and kind of good. I, I seem to remember it was one of the first sims that really gave you a uh, real real tire feel, like we now know, and the way the tires. Uh, but this is me just shit talking. Never ever driven a Formula Ford, so what do I know? What do I know is that you then went to Formula Three. At oh, I did. Um, actually, I did a, a season of like. Um, well, now they call it German Formula Four, but it's oh, um, it's Formula Masters. Yeah, not not Formula Three. Formula Masters. Yeah, yeah. The ADAC yeah. Formula Formal Masters. I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't speak German. Yeah. German F4 now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but those were really equivalent. So downforce now, like 
um, like uh, I don't know, maybe f Formula Fords with wings, like we have some now. Yeah, it's um, it's yeah, it's basically like what modern F four is, like maybe even slightly less downforce. Um, like you could, if you lost your entire wing, you'd get a little bit of understeer, but it wouldn't be like you'd still keep going basically and uh, not lose too much time so um yeah they were slightly less powerful i think than the fords and they had um basically like twice as wide tires or something like that like a lot wider tires um so it was but i mean for me it was it was it was good like they had um it was the same tire manufacturer as um as in ford so i actually um i got to grips with that thing quite quickly um and yeah so it's sort of uh i came in as rookie but it kind of i had a bit of like a, a sort of a, a good base from from formula ford yeah um, because you actually did pretty well on that one just coming yeah second in championship five wins and 13 po podiums i call that a yeah. success <laughs> yeah yeah basically like so um Like I didn't do badly in Formula Ford either, but like I, I did a lot of fastest laps, but I um and then like three podiums, but um like yeah, like in my second year I kind of everything kind of fell into place a bit more and I stopped crashing. And um yeah, it it was um well I was very close to winning it actually. Like it was uh it was it went down to the foot like uh, the final four minutes of the of the season. <laughs> of the last race and uh like basically i had to win the last race with the um, i was racing pascal verline that year for the for the uh for the title and um yeah he he'd, he'd gone out early uh for some sort of mechanical issue i think and uh yeah and i was leading with uh, four minutes left and then i had a mechanical issue of my own and uh pulled off better very sad That must hurt. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was a it was an interesting season because like the teams were all kind of fighting each other, like uh, off track a lot. Uh, they like protested and then counter protested, and yeah, I tried to stay out of all that to as much as I could because uh, it got it got a bit silly. Like um, yeah, they ended they yeah, but. Uh, Yeah, it was good. It was a good, good season, but uh, it was just a, yeah, annoying way to finish it. Really, like it kind of. Every time I think of that season, I was like, ah, oh, so close. <laughs> My German <Okay>. championship <laughs> for yeah. grabs and a mechanical issue. Um, yeah, basically, gets but, it all off. Yeah, but it was much more professional, like setup in general than Formula Ford. Like Formula Ford. Um, Like the team was really, really good, but like there was just another. It still kind of had like a national sort of feeling to it. I don't know. Like it, it sort of. There was one engineer, and he sort of was was. Uh, he had like every all the setups in his head, and uh, he was really, yeah. He sort of, oh, you have a bit of oversteer. Okay, I'll just do this, and then it's like, okay, it's actually really good, and then you go fast. Whereas. Um, Yeah, the German F4 was much more sort of European kind of, I don't know, like just felt like a kind of higher level, a bit more of a professional championship overall. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it was it was it was good good season. Got uh, got some wins. Got my first car win, which was nice as well. So yeah, um, but also much less. Much less crazy sort of racing in general than Formula Ford. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. That that I was just looking at the results. Yeah, but... no, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's one of those that you look and you, you you really knowing now knowing that you lost it in the last four minutes. It's I, I feel for you. <laughs> um, and then you, yeah. yeah, and then you went to F3, uh, I, and I see with yeah. Volkswagen as well. So was there a connection there from that point on? Um, sort of like they 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 backed the team. I think they 
uh, I can't remember to be honest. Like, um, I was kind of had my my manager and my dad kind of deal with that side of it. But it was mainly, um, I think they helped with the engine a little bit. Um, so yeah, we did Formula Three Euro Series, which was, um, yeah, there was one, there was two big Euro like Formula Three level championships at the time. There was GP three and uh, Formula Three Euro Series. So um, yeah, we went in with like brand new car, uh, new team. It was actually one of the teams that I raced against in uh, in in Formula Four, um, and uh, yeah, we raced. Uh, yeah, they sort of wanted wanted to have me to help them, uh, or wanted me as a driver. And um, my teammate that year was Tom Blomqvist as well, and. Um, yeah, we just it was it was tricky because the team was brand new so like we didn't really like we hit the first the first uh, practice session we were like 3 seconds off. Um and then the second practice session we were one and a half seconds off. <laughs> so uh we started learning. So I hit the ground running a little bit or not hit the ground running the opposite. The opposite of that. <laughs> In the deep end or whatever. <laughs> I was just thinking three seconds after that seemed to hit the ground running. <laughs> no, no. Wrong expression. <laughs> yeah, but you actually kind of got there because then you did two no two championships, but in the same year with them, right? Um, At least it so that was as different. Yeah, it was the it was the. Um, it was the Formula 3 Euro Series and the, um, at the same time, it was also European the FIA Formula 3. Formula yeah. 3. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah. No, it's because they had, oh yeah, it's because they had British Formula 3 and they had European Formula 3 and then they also had GP3. So they were trying to merge the two F3 series sort of together with the FIA European. So it was a bit messy at that point. That was before they did the proper FIA European Championship. Oh. Um, so yeah, I only did really one championship then that season. But yeah, we managed to get a couple of podiums. Or one podium? Uh, no, we got three podiums. Three think, podiums yeah. on the European yeah. one. And Euro Series, two podiums. Yeah. Um, that was a Norris ring, I think. I forget what the other two were, but yeah. Norris, Norris ring. ring. I love good. Norris ring. Just yeah. love it. <laughs> Just I don't know yeah. why it's just a sh such short track, but I always loved it. In the same, I, uh, uh, race of seven, I always loved it going around that track. Mm. It's a very silly track. Yeah, very silly <laughs> track. <laughs> I don't know why I, lo I like yeah. it, uh, but yeah. Uh, and let's bring it to world. Uh, I, I'm we're going into. I, I don't actually know where you went from Formula Ford. We never talked about it. So where did it go? We went to Formula Renault the following year. And um, I think we did probably only about five races. And at this point, <clears throat> we kept complaining to Renault because we were just so slow engines and to the point <laughs> Sorry. we ended up considering this is a like Formula Ford, it's a spec series and we ended up having Renault gave us an engine and we went quicker so we were saying that the whole time this is supposedly a spec series and limited engine tuning how are we it was estimated we were about 25 to 40 horsepower down in those little ones is that's a lot and it got to the point where you could come out the corner and be gaining you know, catching the person on exit and then they drive away from you and you're in the toe and you're like Fuck. so this is what we went with to Renault and we obviously knew people at Renault and they gave us an engine and we had our best result. I can't remember what it was. It's probably only a top 10. And then they went, right, you see, this, I was like, there's a problem. Because obviously, we don't have mountain engines, which were the ones that Mana Motorsport and Petonia were using. 
So it was like, and that's when at the same time we were running the Euroboss cars for customers. And I had my first go in a Formula 3000. Hmm. So it's sort of, we made the decision to go, because I'd done a few tests for the team in F3, because we ran an F3 team. And I openly admit it, I was shit. Dreadful. I just was, me in F3 just didn't work. Could, just couldn't figure them out, couldn't get it right. But I got in the 3000 car and it was just there. There was something about the horsepower clicked with me and the more of it I had, the easier I found the car to drive. So that was like going from a, what, two, 200 horsepower odd Formula Renault into 450, 500 horsepower, 3000 car at Snetterton, the old Snetterton. Which was basically two big straights in the bomb hole. And yeah, we were on pace for the British Championship at that time, which was British F2 with Supernova and Gareth Reese and that. We were on a par with their sort of pace. So we sort of made the decision that rather than spending the money in Formula Renault, which we were never going to get anywhere because we didn't. Basically, if you weren't in Mana Motorsport with mountain engines, you weren't, and he won every race that year, if I remember. Mm. So we decided to go different, and we knew we weren't going to go to F3 because just didn't have the pace in it. So we went, right, we'll go a different route. So we went the 3000 route with the Euroboss stuff. Uh, Reminds me, 3000 was kind of F. To it, like, it, it, it's it, yeah, it was the precursor to F2. I'm old, Pedro. No. <laughs> I'm not that old, but okay. I remember that. But I would just well, we, ask. we knew the 3000 was the way to go. On there was an official, oh, an official, unofficial test at Silverstone on the GP circuit with the proper European 3000 boys. And we were, we went and did it. And at the time, I think I was just about a second off Montoya, who was leading, who was the boy at the time, old Juan. Juan. So we knew that it was, it suited my style and my talent better to go that route and try to do something different. Because, like I say, we weren't going to do the grassroots of. Formula Ford, F3, win the title, went, and then Formula 1, that wasn't going to happen. So we had to think outside of the box. Improvise a bit. Mm. Yeah. And that's basically where your kind of trajectories um, go different ways, I think. Because you, Emil, continues in F3 and GP3. Were the cars exactly the same, G GP3 and F3? Um, at the no, so basically, uh, GP3 had like it was like a mid step between Formula 3 and um, GP2. and uh, Formula 2, yeah, GP2, Formula Renault, two, uh, 3.5, I mean, yeah, and um, so <laughs> yeah, my 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 entire career, I was just going up like a half step the whole time, so I was doing like Formula Ford to Formula 4 to Formula 3 to like German Formula 3, which was slightly more powerful to gp3 which is um yeah pretty fast i can't remember how much power but it was i think it was like 400 no i can't remember I can't remember it's one of those things that everyone asks you about but then you <laughs> you're just like, i don't know i just go as fast as i can <laughs> um but uh yeah yeah it was um yeah so i i i mean you you kind of yeah if you do a test with something you kind of figure out whether you're good in it or not it's a bit tough though because like a lot of the time they want you to like sign sign with a team before you can even get the chance to test because the testing was so restricted so like you know if you wanted to from formula 3 onwards basically you would have to like almost blind sign with teams um 
which is, you know, Weird. you don't know how you're gonna, yeah, you don't know how you're gonna gel with with like the car they have and the setup they run and the team, obviously. Um, so you know, you kind of bit of a leap of faith sometimes, but uh, well, you know, it 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 worked out, sort of. I I seem to spy a little name here in I think this is German Formula th Formula Three. The German Formula 3 Cup, which you uh, race for Lotus. Was this their ju kind of junior uh, Formula 3 uh, team? Um, it was uh, it was some sort of sponsorship deal. So Lotus was just sponsoring motorsport at that time. So they sponsored the team. Oh, okay. Uh, but not me. So I, But it was quite cool. I mean, I got to run with a Lotus livery and stuff. Yeah, the so black and gold. Take, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, Jimmy exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Basically. And then you went Formula Middle East. So is this? This is all F F three. Okay, it was Formula, Formula, Formula Middle East was like a a winter series. So, um, you. Yeah, this was at the end of the Formula 3 season. So basically, the Formula 3 season, the the car was not that quick. Um, and I did a test with Pramer at the end of the season. And before the last race, actually, in, in Formula 3. Um, and <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, this makes so much sense. Now I can see why, you know, why Yoncadella and Marcello are just like seven tenths quicker than me um because that that car is so it was so easy to drive and i don't know i mean it yeah it's sort of at least for me as well like it definitely suited my style like i know some drivers drove that car and couldn't get on with it but for me it was like ideal and um then i hopped into formula then i hopped into the the last race of the season in my regular car and was just like oh man i was it was one of the most sort of demotivating weekends of my uh of my uh career basically <laughs> i was just sitting there just you know like seven tenths it's in the car like i just knew it at that time and i was like ah yeah. you just see people passing you off the start with their superior start strategy as well and you're kind of yeah so um but yeah at the end of that season we did uh i did formula middle east which was like a winter series in formula bmw cars and um oh from uh, yeah okay from the uh, yeah okay yeah um just sort of like a practice a lot of the other drivers were doing like um toyota racing series um but uh we thought we'd be uh super cool and go do the uh formula middle east and um i mean it ended up being quite well because i got to learn got to know bahrain track quite well and um but yeah I, I won all the races got all the poles got all the fastest laps um <laughs> Yeah, I was. I think every race I was about a second quicker than everyone. Um, yeah, and those were the was, Formula I mean, BMW sequential, but not uh, unaided, right? You had clutch as well, or at um, this point, you had not to, anymore. You had to lift throttle on upshifts, but and then do a little blip on the down changes. But that was otherwise, it was pretty straight, pretty straightforward. You didn't need to use the clutch to change gears. So the iRacing model of manual transmissions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, like the um, yeah, some of the so yeah, I don't know the um, the the Lotuses are actually quite quite okay. Yeah, um, I love the Lotus. But uh, yeah, so so did that and kind of just used it as like a super long test session. I got um, a lot of uh, well, six of my career wins were there, so I added up the number i had the most wins of anyone that's that year until that point <laughs> i showed up and got all the stats up on driver database and autosport mentioned me like four times in a row for all my wins and <laughs> it was nice for the stats did but, you uh, have yeah. your deal with carlin Dunn before that or uh so this this was before the um this was the end of 2012, so this was before I did the uh, German Formula Three, but I hadn't, I didn't have any deals lined up then. Oh, um, yeah. So 
then yeah then i did the season of german formula 3 which uh was probably the toughest season of my career to be honest cuz um yeah i was just 6 tenths off my teammate and that was just like a really bad feeling <laughs> basically um you know uh if you're trying to be a racing driver you can't be six tenths off your teammate basically so um we tried lots of stuff all season but fundamentally we just very have very different driving styles and i'm i also had a tendency to attack way too much in the corners like try to really like dive in on the brakes and then like sort of use the brake to rotate and then yeah, sort of maybe over, even overlap a bit of throttle and brake uh, in the middle, which um, that car just didn't like at all. Um, but also that season, I drove the Prima for the Zandvoort Masters of F3, and I got a third, even though I just kind of jumped in and just did that race. Um, and that had some really, really fast boys like Felix Rosenquist and uh, Alex Lynn was my teammate, Lucas Auer as well. And, um, yeah, like I, I, that season we really wanted to do the season with Prima, but, uh, they'd already signed all their drivers basically. So, uh, we went for the next best thing, which was what we thought would be a fairly straightforward, um, maybe not win, but, you know, like challenge for the championship in, in, in German F3, but yeah, it turned out to be a bit of a nightmare to be honest. Um, but yeah, the funny thing about that as well was that um, the, my teammate that year, Marvin Kirchhofer, he, um, he, did, uh, he also did a test for Prima, and he didn't like that car at all. Like, he had the exact opposite feeling to me. So he loved our regular uh, Lotus, I guess you could call it. But he could not get on with the Prima, and I had the exact opposite feeling. Um, so yeah, like, that was just kind of interesting to see how different people's driving styles can be. Um, yeah, yeah, and that was that was 2013. <laughs> and how <laughs> weird a that a spec series is not spec at all. <laughs> yeah, well, it's Formula Three wasn't spec at that time. Uh, you could actually just show up in a, like a Lolo or something. Oh, uh, but no one was doing it because uh, the Delara was pretty pretty much the go-to. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they had, there was a lot of range for setup variants. Like you could, you could add different springs and set up the suspension completely differently. Like you could manufacture basically a lot of your own components and put extra little winglets on if you had the budget. But, um, but, uh, yeah, so it was kind of like a mini F1 to be honest at the time. I see that the engines were different as well one was a mercedes the Prima one was a mercedes and the other one was the vw so might that like drivability drivability wise be a little bit different and you favored one to the other or your driving style favored one from the other uh no i think they're both pretty equal like every every sort of weekend you'd have someone saying like, oh no the mercedes is op or too powerful and it's so unfair, you know, we're in Volkswagen and stuff. But then, you know, then I drove the Prima, who was running on Mercedes, and then I was like, ah, okay, well, it's just because it's just a, it's a really well set up car. Um, so I, for for me, it was it was, yeah, mainly set up basically, um, set up difference. It was like it was like trying two different, completely the, like the opposite ends of the spectrum. There would be like. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just got on with one better than the other one, basically. Yeah, almost like girlfriends. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm a father now, so I, I'm, I can. I'm allowed some dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um. you, then you went to GP3. So... Um, with uh, Carlin, I, I almost my eyes yeah. just. So you went, you, you went to Carlin at. I seem to remember that it was uh, Carlin as well that Felix Acosta went with uh, because he was a Red Bull driver back then. So I, I don't mm -hmm. know. I, 
I, I I seem to to think that all is to at least uh, think that they are pretty in line. So normally, Red Bull sponsors Carlin, uh, or in my mind, they do. Um, yeah. But you were able to to get in the Carlin and not be really. Or you were never backed by Red Bull, were you? No, no, no. Um, um, we. Uh... Yeah, like we wanted to do GP3, so um, uh, but yeah, my teammate was uh, Alex Lynn, was uh, was Red Bull driver that one season. Um, um, yeah, so he was. Yeah, so we we sort of, um, yeah, we ended up winning the championship that year, basically, uh, in the teams, and he won the the champ the uh, drivers as well. Um, But yeah, it was a it was a bit of a weird season to be honest. It was it was good, but it was like uh like looking back on it now, there was like quite a there was just like one thing that sort of held me back more than anything else really. Um and it was uh <laughs> we had a big argument over this actually at one point. Was uh was that they didn't want to uh let me have a stiff they they wanted to um They they didn't want to let me have like a softer brake pedal at the time. Um, so I sort of I I kept saying to them like I I can't really press the brake this hard and and um, their their side of it was that the um, the you know like well the Costa and uh, a lot of the other drivers they prefer a stiff pedal and um, I was like yeah but I don't like it. <laughs> So um but uh, yeah so we had a big argument over that but didn't get to didn't get to change it like I thought you know okay well maybe I'll just build up some leg muscles or something um but yeah the thing was like it was just I just couldn't press the right amount of brake so um I sort of I just lost I didn't have any brake feeling um so I was losing sort of three tenths or I don't, I don't know how much time it was really but I just yeah, I had no brake feeling and then the next season I I went in to to Arden and I asked them like, "Oh, could I get a softer brake?" and they were like, "Yeah." <laughs> and then we had a great season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but like I can understand their point of view as well because it's they they get a lot of drivers who just come in and and don't really know what they want, so then you know, they they change some th they ask the team to change some things on the car and then the car just becomes worse, right? Um, you know, you, you go down like a an avenue of, on setup or, or or whatever, and it just doesn't, it's just not quicker. Like, it just makes the car slower. And that's what they thought that this was. But um, yeah, I, I know now that it just would have made me quicker, basically. That's also why I sort of accepted what they said at the time. Yeah. Uh... I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a strange one when there's only one person pushing the brakes whilst driving the car and you think, keep that person happy. And if a softer brake pedal is going to do that, it's going to obviously promote a better driver. It's a strange one, isn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, basically it was. But it was I don't know. I mean, I was I was I generally like quite a soft brake pedal. And I'm I'm a bit of an outlier on that point, um, but I think it in 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 like Formula Two, it's more important um, generally just because of the um, the way that car brakes um, to be able to hit like the high peak, but also have like some control like lower down in the in the sort of braking range. But um, yeah, the uh, the the GP3 car, I think it was. It would just have been quicker to to have a softer brake pedal, basically. Yeah, it seems weird that yeah. I, I I don't know how much would you what would need to be done, and if it was that difficult to to do, it just seems one of those things. It's not like some drivers that ask for a completely different wheel. I've heard some stories that Pastor Maldonado basically asked Lotus to make him like, I don't know, a weird configuration of 
pedals and and they had to to have like the shifters go both ways because he wanted to shift up and down with one hand and all that stuff uh, that seems hard to like to engineer and actually do two different steering wheels but just make a brake pedal softer is that that hard <laughs> i don't know no, no, they, like, they, they, it, it wasn't it wasn't whether they could do it like they definitely could do it but it was just it was just like a sort of principle that it was better to learn um how to break sort of correctly um and i think yeah i think if you can hit the pressure it's it's better to have a, a harder pedal but um but yeah so basically in 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 gp3 it wouldn't make a difference but in in gp2 it it would have and in formula one i think it would have as well but in formula one you have all the brake ramping and all these like little toys you can mess around with whereas in formula 2 you have to go fully organic or whatever you want to call it or almost that if you see the the amount of diffs and all that stuff and brake pressure on entry and yeah it's crazy the amount of buttons that that thing has <laughs> uh, yeah. but so you did two seasons of gp3 and I only see two races in GP2. Was the opportunity not there and they just called you? What kind of happened there? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it was a bit funny. Uh, so the regular driver, he just um, apparently just didn't show up to the Malaysia round. And um, yeah, <laughs> they'd had a bad season. And he just didn't didn't show up, so they they ended up having a yeah, just running one car that that week uh, or that that race, which you're not allowed to do in Formula Two. There's a rule against it. Um, so you like if you can't get a driver, you have to pay the championship a certain amount of money as a fine. So like it was, you know, basically they they needed a driver for the last race, and uh, yeah, they. Uh, they asked if I wanted to do it, so uh, I did. I did it, and um, it was a much, very much a learning experience, I would say. Um, but uh, it was very cool. But yeah, we it was only. Uh, yeah, we had we had. Uh, unfortunately, I I only managed. Oops, I only managed to warm up my. Um, my uh, front brakes in the first race so i had no rear brakes for the first like 80 percent of the race or the first half anyway and um so i finished last in that one and then the second race was actually quite good but yeah it was still like uh sort of battling over 14th 15th not fun at all at yes marina yeah, yeah. how is it yeah track? Also, is, is it that bad <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's one of my one of my greatest regrets in my racing career was that i never got to drive a formula 2 car anywhere apart from uh yas marina <laughs> like uh so i mean now it. it's much better now it's much better but the old one was by far my least favorite track but apart from i mean the setting and everything and the event is really really cool but the track itself was horrible <sighs> And well, I saw a picture the other day. What about Sochi? Was that much better? Uh, I didn't like Sochi that much either. Um, but yeah, particularly the last sector was very, very uh, fiddly and annoying. It just seems 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. I mean, the like that left-hander complex seems fun, but probably more in the Formula 1 car. Yeah, well, the the fast left-handers, I don't know how they get it through the FIA grading system because that thing is super dangerous. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, metal just, you know, it's very big one there. So quick, it, yeah, it's so quick, and there's no runoff. But uh, whatever. Um, yeah, I was it was all right. I, I never did particularly great around Sochi, but uh, or Abu Dhabi to be <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. No, it was it was good. Yeah, I had the yeah, 
it was a uh, it was it was fun it was fun but we uh yeah i had my i had my the second the second gp3 season was was really really good in uh, in 2015 got my break the way i wanted it and yeah kind of had a really really good one and uh nearly well we we got we got the most uh what's it called the most feature race points scored the most points in feature races so i i just call myself feature race champion even though no one recognizes it <laughs> you say you were bad at sochi but you got the podium there so and that's yeah. yes maria let's be honest so <laughs> i don't know what the fuck you're on about then <laughs> yeah. well it was, it was all relative like i was if if i looked at my pace throughout the, that season in 2015 i um I've, i felt like i had the the pace to win everywhere apart from um abu dhabi and uh Ah, uh, there was one more. I forget what it was. Maybe Sochi as well. Maybe it was those two. No, yeah. Anyway, there was. Um, I was. We were really strong in race pace, basically that season, and um, yeah, like uh, just kept getting taken out in the reverse grid races. Unfortunately, yeah, it seems like that's because he Hungaro Ring Spa and Monza. You, uh you actually had Spa and Monza. You won, and then DNF. So. <laughs> Yeah, I I I bookended both my wins with uh with DNFs, completely surrounded them. Sadly, but that kind of ruined my my uh, my championship. Um yeah, it was all just really silly stuff as well, like not really much I can do about it, so it just kind of happens. Yeah, and now the big question. Um because Earl when let's uh say that the F1 dream was not on anymore you went to sports cars um but you emil you just uh said goodbye why not continue in motorsports and drive around with around good circuits with good cars some of the names that you uh. dropped there went to from the e and uh championships like that was it now yeah. in the cards? I mean, no, I mean, it's sort of, for me, like, Formula One was kind of everything, to be honest. So I I wanted to give it a chance until, like, it was completely impossible. Um, so I, yeah, we sort of tried to get the money together for a full F2 season. Um, and it sort of looked like it might happen for for quite a while as well it was like there was something bubbling in the background never really turned into anything and um yeah i mean yeah i don't know i just i just never never wanted to do anything like it didn't didn't really get me excited all the rest of motorsport um i mean now obviously i'm kind of like yeah well you know i could <laughs> i could definitely do something if it if the opportunity came up but you At the time, I was just a hypercar. Imagine, <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty cool. But yeah, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I just felt like I, I just wanted to go fully towards that. And if it wasn't going to work, then I didn't really, you know, then I didn't really want to do anything else, particularly, you know. And then, um, yeah, that was that's basically why. Um, I mean, it's not super easy to do other stuff as well, but um, I think there was a couple like small opportunities here and there, which I just didn't really pursue at the time because so I wasn't, yeah, wasn't wasn't really uh, looking at that. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I I myself can't really understand it, but I I do I kind of understand it, uh, but I was never in the position to think all that big you actually got um far but um in the other way early you, your family trade was motorsports so you actually had some good times both in like oh it, it, you can't really show the, to make emil jealous the the poster that you have behind you i don't know if you can show it just to make emil Sorry, je no. very jealous can you? Sorry, Are you able? Podcast, you <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
Yeah, it, it's it's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm more up, up, yeah. That's a '94 Benetton. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bring it right in. Oh yeah, you can leave it there. You can just go away and leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. So that's Donington, I guess. Spa, right? Was it a spa? I thought that looked like Donington. I think. Okay. I think. It's, yeah, Donington. It's Donington. Donington. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah. That's that's Boss, right? Yeah, Boss GP. Was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was before it became Euro. I think it might have been Euroboss then still. It went through a few different name iterations. Uh-huh. But how, yeah, uh-huh. like, how would you, how are those cars compared to like all the junior Formula cars? Oh, I mean, the F1 stuff of that area is. It's a lot more physical than obviously the F3s, and that was all I had any experience of. But like that, Benetton particularly was. We were quite lucky. Is the team that were running that the the guy who was the so-called engineer, if you will, he understood that car and he really knew how to. And the setup on it was just it was on rails pretty much everywhere. Obviously, we weren't ever going to be within 100% of what that car's capable of doing. We were on Avon tyres, which they made specially to fit to suit um, the Euroboss car. So we were never going to be anywhere near good, the Goodyear sort of super grip. But I think I got down, not that car, but a 91 car I got within... 1.3 seconds of Senna's lap record that he did it in 93 at Donington. Nice. So we could still push. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, brutal braking. They suited me. I was very much a. I liked the fact that it was opposite to you, a very stiff brake pedal, like a z- zero movement in it. But it was full force and then bleed off the brakes is almost the reverse of steel brakes so massive pressure and then nothing would happen for a split second and then you would have maximum braking Mm. and just everything went forwards it was brutal braking you know we were hitting four five g like current f1 guys you know and then bleed the brake off trail braking style in but and that car was like a go kart. It was just all front end, okay. just all all front end. So it was literally, it went wherever you wanted, which is obviously what Schumacher created that whole ninety two, three, four era of Benettons that he designed. Where it was all on the front end. Mm. So there we go. And but again, we weren't paddle shifting those. Those were sequential. I think Benetton might. Ninety four. No, I think they. Special. It's sequential, but they had them out. Yeah, they had paddles, but they took the paddles out, so we were so we were running a sequential shifter. So just a stick. A sequential stick. Yeah, stick shift. Yeah. Was that like uh, for uh, maintenance reasons or? Yeah, just because software side of things. Because obviously, the ninety four were fully active cars. Uh, so active oh, suspension, yeah. active suspension, ABS. Well, sorry, active braking, not ABS. Okay. <laughs> they and had a few and... traction control. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, <laughs> they did used to fart coming out of corners, but it wasn't official traction control. Yeah, but yeah, those. Cars, I mean, it was. It's said to be one of the most technologically advanced cars of the nineties. That that ninety four Benetton, because they were just some super clever guys behind it. But yeah, it was mainly software side. So and obviously, we had the guy that owns the cars, and that they don't want to spend millions of pounds a year running the car. So it was. 
and they were still capable. I mean, we've got, I think, had two, two or three lap records with that car, which still stand. So they were, you know, well, we were what, going some. Yeah. No, what were you uh, like beating in that case? Um, we the far, the newest cars were, I think they were two thousand and seven Tyrrells, the European Aviation. So Paul Stoddard, he um, he came out with some of those, and then there was a lot of Benettons and some. We we had a hybrid three thousand car with the F one engine in it, which was a bit of a. <laughs> It was an experiment to help um, do some de- development work on this engine, which was supposedly going to be a sports car engine, but it, I, I would have think it would have ended up being the um, LMP2 engine, the Orica style, is okay. what they were aiming for, but it never sort of happened. But that was 4-litre V8 with about 750 horsepower unrestricted. How did the chassis hold up? <laughs> to be fair, right. in the 3000, the chassis was all right. It held it. The biggest problem we had with that, very similar to your Shunset brands with the throttle sticking into clearways. So I think we were running 40, 40 something second laps on the Indy circuit with it. I mean, it was ridiculously fast. <laughs> Big. Going through the little chicane, the we had re- we had to retrofit carbon discs to it because the steels couldn't handle the speed we were getting out of the car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it the disc got too hot and popped the seals on the caliper and popped the calipers. So I think the data showed going through the little left right chicane would. When I hit the brakes, it was about 120, 135, something like that. But when I hit the brakes, it popped the pistons, which put the brake pedal to the floor. And the way the configuration was in that car, the brake bus adjuster went in front of the throttle, so it opened the throttle. So... Okay. Yeah. So we went from, I think it was 135 to zero in about 1.2 seconds. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it destroyed a car, but. I was going to. Well, it sounded like it was fun while it lasted. <laughs> yeah, it did. I mean, it was that I think I, I still hold the lap record at, Bra- uh, not Brands Thruxton with that. We did like a 60 second lap at Thruxton with it in a race. Damn, I, I don't have any reference for it, but I, it's, I, I, I have a feeling that's pretty insanely I quick. Saw the other day in the wiki page. Yeah, yeah, Thruxton still stands. Yeah. That was, I think we, I think the average was something like a hundred and fifty odd mile an hour average speed, and we, we got just on. I, I want to say it was one hundred ninety three down the straight, and Thruxton is obviously very bumpy. Oh, uh, yeah, that was. Yeah, the F3 with generic Vern was 1 minute 6.7, and you did it in 1 minute 1.9. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was British Formula 3 in 2010. Yeah. But they weigh, they weigh like nothing, those nothing. F3 cars as well. And they, but they, yeah, they have a lot of downforce and then don't really. <laughs> you get out of the corners and nothing really happens. You kind of hit top speed. Yeah, store. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, properly yeah. fast. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was just different, but it was sort of then. By that point, I then moved on and was doing more sports car stuff than the Eurobus stuff, and that's when the new crop of guys turned up and a new load of cars became available. So you had a lot of, there's a Toro Rosso running around some Jaguars. I think there's an, there's a couple of the original uh, rebels. Yeah. The guy First from Rebel, so. runs a Toro Rosso. The one that Vettel won Monza 
Dan Daniel. Uh, it's something is like his, that. Is I, his name Daniel? I think so. He runs. Yeah, I think he won his first race last year. I think. Yeah, so you got that, and then Fritz Veneerd of Jumbo, who basically sponsors everyone Dutch, is um he's got. I think he's got forty or fifty F1 cars. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> How much do they go for, like, on average? Um, it varies. You can get, let's say, a mid-90s, early 90s, sort of 92, 93 Benetton, probably 120, 150 grand, 200 grand, if it's got no history to it and no pedigree, so to speak. And I did know of a... 2000 Barrichello Ferrari went for 4 million but the equivalent Schumacher car is 6 million, 10 million depending on if they come up for sale Mm. the biggest they're not too, unless you're buying the top, top, top car the Schumacher car, they're not that expensive the problem is the running costs Mm. So in the older cars, if you leased an engine, because a lot of places won't sell you an engine, you're looking at, and this was back then, so this was early 2000s, you were looking at around £20 a mile just to run the engine. Okay. (laughs) And the engines were life to around 2000, between 2000 and 5000 K, depending on how much performance you extracted from it so you could essentially have like an endurance version so they cut the revs down it still had probably 600 horsepower but it lasted twice as long before you needed to do any work on it Mm. or you could have full beans and it (laughs) didn't last very long (laughs) it blows up after 10 minutes or something (laughs) Yeah, and you just, it's the same with everything. If you push it to the max, everything else, the risk gets greater on everything. Mm. And then you take discs, carbon discs. To buy a set of carbon discs, if you could get Brembo, still had them and you bought new ones, 10 grand a set, 10 grand a corner. You know, you can just do ridiculous money. And that's where. And I know a lot of people over the years that we've sold cars to or have bought F1 cars and the idea and the fantasy is brilliant and if you told someone you could have a Formula 1 car for a quarter of a million, they'd be like, fucking brilliant. And then they go, right, how do I start it? Is that, <laughs> well, you need a team of three people. Yeah. Ah, and then all of a sudden the reality bites of... And also you can't, especially these days, you can't just go anywhere with them because of noise limits. So many tracks now have X amount of noise days. But and like surely this will like when when the like hybrid cars come out, that's gonna completely change it, surely, because they'll be so difficult to start and maintain and keep running, I would imagine. Yeah. And that's where Ferrari were one of the first to do it a long time ago. They formed Corsa Clienti, which is their customer department. So the way that works generally is you buy your car, let's say your four million pound car from Barrichello's car, and then Ferrari keep it, and they will have a calendar of events they'll run through the year, and they'll say, right, we're going to Spa this weekend are we taking your car? You go, yes. They take your car, they run it for the weekend, and it's sort of known that it's basically blank check. And mm. you turn up in Ferrari gear, and you've got Ferrari hospitality, and you get to pretend to be a Ferrari driver. Mm. And you go and you do your sessions, and they look after the car, and then they take <laughs> it back to the factory, strip it down, rebuild it, prep it like they would... And the guys, because we used to work with them, so a lot of the guys in there were original mechanics back in the early 90s on the race team, and it sort of, as they decided to no longer race, they moved around the factory to the customer side. Mm. 
and all that will happen is the other teams, if they decide to start selling stuff, you'll get the likes of Mercedes have their version if they're going to. But I can't see a lot of people running them because they're just too complex. And actually, yeah, I'd imagine they get pretty expensive. Yeah, and actually, I don't see them doing like selling many cars now. Many F1 cars. We're talking about F1 cars. Oh, they'll still sell them. It's just whether people will be able to drive them. Let's be honest, like the 2000 S Ferraris, they were technical, but they didn't have, like you mentioned earlier, they didn't have all the brake settings, diff locks, diff ramps, engine ramps. They didn't have all of that. They were a lot more rudimentary, but still incredibly complex. But you could drive it without having to change diff settings three times in a lap. Whereas the cars these days is just, you can't just go and drive it round. You actually have to be tinkering, so to speak. Mm. Yeah. I know nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> I press go in my simulator and it's, it goes. <laughs> it's it's, 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 it's and everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's like you with the hypercar in changing from balance to attack twice in a lap just to get the optimal lap you know the boys these days are like you know they're doing it two three times between corners and all the and i think that's where the modern cars aren't ever going to be able for basically rich boys to play with because one they won't fit in them <laughs> and two, yeah, they're just not as simple. Yeah, they might have anti stall and all that side of it. So, but yeah, I don't see it. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm I'm on a diet right now. Uh, I'll be able to fit. Just the problem of the money, but that's just a little problem. I want my Red Bull. <laughs> I think you probably find there's going to be more chance of people buying these hypercars in a. Five ten years time, and what they're saying of Porsche now as a customer team, you're looking at twelve million. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know people now that would pay for that just to go and use it as a track day car two three times a year. They will probably get it because I think Porsche is actually kind of reviving the old when they had the Group C customer car program. So mm -hmm. we're talking about eighties style of customer teams running against the official mm -hmm. team and all that stuff so it might actually yeah, but end goal is a, yeah a Porsche still wins doesn't matter if it's oh. the works team or effect but a Porsche still wins that's where they're not not silly are they no they're not silly not at all it's not a win by numbers it's not a coincidence <laughs> that uh, they win basically in everything that they go on to so just throw lots of money to it and uh, get the right people which are going to Audi in F1 <laughs> the right man for the job is going to Audi in F1 uh, <laughs> so yeah we won't take more of your time Emil um, uh, I, I would like to thank you very much for coming and you know you're always welcome to go to come again this is the first experience uh I hope that you liked it. Um, please tell everyone where they can find you and what you're doing and what you want people to know you're doing, basically. Yeah, it was great. Like, thanks for having me, guys. Um, it's my first podcast I've ever done, so uh, got that ticked off the list. Not a virgin <laughs> anymore. <guess>. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, no. So I I, uh, I I I stream on Twitch now. Uh, go f can go follow me on there. It's just my name, Emil Bernstorff. and uh, I try with to upload two some. Fs. <laughs> yeah, with two apps. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and then I I upload some of those videos on YouTube as well. Um, here and there. So uh, if you want, you can follow me there as well. Feel free. Yeah, um, on show notes, there there are some links to those 
uh, to both the YouTube streams uh, channel and the Twitch channel, which was where I found you, actually found you. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so that, that's that's uh, that's that's that. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, thank you. You're always welcome. Um, thank you, Earl, for being here and being my uh, resident res racing driver or former racing driver. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find all at Earl Goddard and at Twitter. That's the main social media that you do. And we both have a team together and uh, we run leagues in uh, multiple platforms that we have uh, iRacing leagues coming on soon. Next February, we have the TWR iSprint series. So if you want to drive hypercars and GT3 cars and LMP2 cars, uh, it's going to run on Saturdays just for one month. And then we're going to have the endurance um, league uh, starting in March and ending uh, in June with the 24 hours of Le Mans. That's going to be fun and tiring. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> very much tiring. Uh, we had, uh, I'm going to do it, do this live. We had a comment, uh, on YouTube, um, earlier from eSIM Racing, the channel eSIM Racing, they are broadcasters and they have a channel and we'd like to announce that TWR, um, is going to stream the races on that channel which is a sim racing channel and race broadcasting channel. All races will be there. Um, this is really the first announcement. We have to do it properly in social media, uh, but we're rubbish at that. <laughs> Hurl is old and I'm old at spirit, so uh, we're slow with that, so be patient with us. Uh, so again, thank you both of you guys to for keeping me in company on a Tuesday and hope we do this again uh, at another day. Next week, Tuesday as well, we have Suelio Almeida, which Emil knows as well. <laughs> Suelio, that's going to be a fun one. So we have a real-life sim, ra uh, real life racer uh, that now really does sim racing, but we'll, maybe we can talk about sim racing another time if you care to join us. And next week, we're going to have a sim racer that is turning real-life racer. Um, so that's going to be fun as well. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, I've been your host, Pedro Barbosa, and we'll see you guys next week. See you later. Draft and Pray is an independent podcast and the music was by Letting Punks Know. <laughs>